Eaton, thank you very much indeed. Um, we have quite a considerable number of members that are joining by uh, Starleaf today. Mm -hmm. Can I recommend that you just keep a good close eye on your mute and unmute button? Probably the mute button is the most important for whenever you're not looking to speak. You don't want people to be hearing what you're saying. Um, and also just to remind people that if you do want to speak at any point during um, a various part of the sessions that you just use the raise hand function is the easiest for us. That is, means then that the little blue light comes up alongside your name here at the screen at the chair's desk, which means then I know to be able to call you and to take part in the conversation. So just remembering that mute buttons are exceptionally important. Uh, if, if you can, just always double check that you're uh, muted when required. I'm going to um, start off today's meeting um, with... Uh, chairman's remarks because for some reason they're always at the end of the meeting and we're always keen to get out through the door uh, but I want to start with those chairman's remarks today uh, and just say that after the chairman's liaison meeting yesterday and um, that the decision uh, has been taken for committees to go fully virtual uh, where that is possible I think that in the current circumstances with coronavirus that's a sensible thing to do um, and I am going to propose that from next week we go fully virtual for the meetings. And I've had a conversation with um, Sound and Vision uh, or the Communications Department in order uh, to work out just exactly what would be required in terms of chairing the meeting remotely. Uh, and apparently we're, we are all good to go and broadcast anything. There may be a few uh, little adjustments that need to be made along the way in terms of if we... Uh, wish to go into committee and, and not broadcasting for a uh, closed session. We may need to just hold off for a few minutes, but uh, there, there, we should be able to conduct all of our business. Anybody that's coming to us to give presentations is doing so uh, remotely and for the foreseeable future, well up until our forward work programme uh, into February. The, anybody that is coming along to give a presentation can do so uh, at the uh, but virtually, so therefore we can conduct the meeting in that manner. So just maybe to seek agreement from members on that front, are members happy enough with that? Great. Okay, that's grand. Um, the other issue on Chairman's remarks then is we've heard quite a lot uh, in the last period of time about uh, transition periods. I would have to say that probably uh, a decent uh, transition period that we're going to see today is that we should start this meeting uh, with the president in America being President Trump and then end this meeting uh, with President Biden uh, or maybe even just a little bit before we get to President Biden but uh, certainly uh, there are exciting events taking place over in Washington and we look forward to seeing um, a closer relationship between uh, the North and uh, the administrations in Washington. And um, also just wanted to highlight, and we do have uh, some officials along a little later, uh, that there was the uh, fire at the weekend for the Multicultural Resource Centre in South Belfast. Uh, racial equality and racial equality strategy uh, and other elements are the responsibility of the executive office. And we have taken evidence sessions and participated uh, in debates as well in the chamber on the issue of racial equality. And I think it's just really important to send a clear message that what happened at the weekend was totally unacceptable, uh, that we are all working together and striving together to create a society in Northern Ireland that is open and welcoming to everyone. Uh, that's, I know, from the members of this committee is the work that we're trying to put in and I certainly hope that we can uh, work with the officials to ensure going forward that all that can be done in terms of racial equality uh, and uh, sort of creating uh, a, a better and more welcoming society, that we can do that. And then we won't see events like we saw uh, at the weekend taking place again. So I hope that we can get that uh, done. Um, we're going to uh, with circulate to members a paper um, which was a, a summary of the meeting that myself and the Deputy Chair had with the various groups from the Historical Institutional Abuse um, Victims Groups, uh, Survivors Groups, 
and um, we have a, a, a minute or a, a list of issues that re were raised from um, that meeting and we have um, we, we will circulate that and I think that that will be really useful for members in preparation for the new commissioner's visit to us uh, two weeks today just to inform us of the issues that they're facing on the ground uh, and then uh, if members can read that document and, and get up to, to date with the issues and if any clarity is needed that could be sought if needed next week and then whenever we have the commissioner and um, we'll be able to um, just ensure that any of the issues being a, 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 a sort of detailed to us are, are being addressed uh, and met by the commission and by the department. So members, if we're happy enough then we will uh, move on today um, in terms of, sorry just had jumped over apologies, we don't have any apologies at this stage or is there any apologies that any member is aware of? Sure. Yes. Uh, Martina will be late to the meeting today. She said she'd probably be about 20 minutes. That's perfect, Pat. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, just jumping ahead then. If members wish to... The draft minutes are available. On page five of the meeting pack, are members content that they are a true reflection of our meeting from last week? Okay, so that's them signed and ready to go. Uh, in terms of matters arising, um, there was some uh, 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 an item, it's an article from the Belfast Telegraph on the 7th of <coughs> January reporting a 10 point recovery plan uh, for COVID, which was by uh, Professors Deirdre Heenan and Gabriel Scali. Uh, maybe in the typical broadcasting way to say that there are other recovery plans available, but that one was referenced by the First and Deputy First Minister during their presentation last week. Um, so uh, it is there and available to look at if members wish to note. Then, members, that's all there is. Anybody else, any issues or matters arising? Then we can move then to item five, which is the historical institutional abuse, and that is the engagement with the institutions. Um, it's on page 17 of the meeting pack, and at this stage I'm hoping we will move up into the spotlight our guests, which um, is Mark Brown, the Deputy Secretary from the Department, and Gareth Johnson from the Victims and Survivors Division in the Executive Office. Um, I have both... Uh, yep, yeah, there we go. Hello to Gareth and to Mark. You're very welcome. Good to see you again, albeit remotely. Um, just as Thank ever, you. we're being broadcast live and Hansard are taking a transcript of the meeting. Um, so I maybe pass over to yourselves to give us uh, an update on the, um, the HIA uh, work with the institutions. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'll just briefly go through the brief that was provided to the uh, committee um, prior to the meeting. So, um, one of the heart uh, recommendations was as follows. We recommend that any voluntary institution found by the inquiry to have been guilty of systemic failings should be asked to make an appropriate financial contribution to the overall cost of the HIA redress board and any specialist support services recommended by the inquiry. The amount and how it would be paid should be negotiated between the government and the institutions concerned in the first instance. Payments and other outlays should be taken into account and set off against any contributions which they, i.e. the institution, may be asked to make so they do not pay twice over for their failings. And Hart went on to say um, that if agreement cannot be reached, all parties should submit to uh, mediation and if not successful, to binding uh, arbitration. So in terms of where we are in, in terms of payment of compensation, payments of compensation to victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse began in May this year. And as of the 31st of December, redress panels have made 261 determinations, totaling 7.382 million. And of that, uh, a total of 5.763 has been paid out into uh, the applicant's uh, bank accounts or into their solicitor's bank accounts. In terms 
terms of engagement by officials with the institutions, we have uh, been engaging with the relevant institutions with ministerial agreement for some time on a fact-finding basis initially in the run-up to the publication of the Hart Report uh, and to outline a more formal approach uh, regarding contributions after publication of the Hart Report. But obviously the suspension of the executive then uh, intervened and put a pause to that contact. A series of, of engagement meetings uh, resumed then in early 2020 uh, on foot of the former Hawks letter, David Sterling, uh, to the institutions, which was sent in November 2019. And the issues dealt with uh, really uh, picked up on prompt access to records, which were required by the address board, and putting the institutions on notice about formal negotiations um, about the contributions to the overall cost of redress. We then undertook a further round of contact in the autumn. In terms of where we are now and next steps, uh, ministers are, are, are very keen uh, that the, uh, the engagement uh, moves forward at, at pace uh, and they will be fronting uh, up that engagement. So they've set out a clear plan for the next steps and it comprises the following. Uh, ministers have written to the Association of Leaders of Missionaries and, Reli and the Religious of Ireland. That's the successor to CORE, which is the like an um, umbrella group for all the religious institutions. I've also written to <clears throat> Archbishop Martin and Archbishop Medole uh, and to Barnardos, inviting them to meet before the end of the first week of February. And the purpose of this meeting uh, will be to update on progress on HIA, including the work of the Redress Board and the HIA Support Service for Victims and Survivors, to update on engagement on unofficial apology, and also to set out plans for negotiations with the institutions uh, and to secure support for a fair and proportionate outcome. Uh, following that initial meeting, uh, FM and DFM will then host a roundtable meeting with the six relevant institutions to emphasize the moral imperative behind the negotiations, uh, the need to make progress, and to agree fundamental principles which would govern the negotiations. And after those in initial two meetings, then junior ministers will host further meetings uh, along with officials uh, and will undertake uh, more detailed ne negotiations as appropriate. So that's the overall process that's been established by ministers. I mean, ultimately, <clears throat> it will be important to have a clear sense of what the award, of what award the board has made relating to each institution before agreements on total contributions are finalized. That was a learning point from the Ryan inquiry in the South. However, that doesn't prevent instigation of the work, nor indeed uh, in seeking initial payments on account from the institutions. As previously advised to the committee, um, it's envisaged that th there should be a, a number of principles underpinning the negotiations, uh, and they should include such matters as, first of all, acceptance of responsibility. Uh, secondly, fairness and equity. Thirdly, uh, transparency and uh, open book uh, accounting. Fourthly, how the starting point for negotiations uh, will be calculated. Fifthly, uh, the valuation of contributions that have already been made uh, by the institutions in terms of awards and the services that they have provided. Uh, sixthly, um, around the management of negotiations. S uh, the seventh point would be around the authority of the negotiators to actually um, commit to uh, um, a, a, an outcome. Um, then the eighth point would be around timelines. And the final point would be really about uh, reporting of outcomes. So those are the principles and some of the key issues that would be um, set out uh, to be um, taken forward in the negotiations. Um, a number of institutions investigated uh, also included institutions in the justice sector, such as Rathgeel, and in the health and social care uh, sector, such as Kinkora. And since the funding for HIA is ring-fenced, uh, it's not proposed to seek to recover costs from other departments, because that would simply displace other funding and divert attention from sources which actually can bolster uh, public funds. So that, so that chair sets out in, in, in broad terms the approach that has been agreed uh, with the institutions and, and gives some background on uh, some of the early work that had been done prior to that. And uh, Gareth and I would be, be happy to take uh, any questions that the committee might have. 
Okay, uh, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate that uh, presentation. I'll start off with a few questions. And maybe, uh, Mark, um, you know, given this is a very sensitive um, issue and the um, will be, albeit uh, we need to deal with the sensitive issue, there will be a considerable uh, spend through this and that money needs to be uh, identified. And it is important that as much of that as is required uh, and is uh, deemed appropriate is recouped. But could the department stand accused in some respects of maybe going a bit light touch in this? Um, you know, we have been back for, for over a, a year at this stage and the report makes reference to some uh, early meetings in 2020, uh, some further engagement in autumn time and then making reference to some engagement that's going to take place um, next month. So I suppose maybe a question is just how intense is that work that is ongoing or is it just sporadic check-ins to see where people are? Um, you know, and is there a definitive timeline roadmap that you're actually working to to get uh, everybody around the table and having the discussions? Well, I think in answering that, Chair, I, I, would, I would say that the key focus um, both when 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 uh, when there were no ministers uh, and subsequently when ministers ministers came back, uh, was the focus on making sure that, that the needs of uh, victims were met, uh, and the key focus around that then was was uh, making sure that the arrangements for redress uh, were in place, uh, that applications could be made, be considered, and the payments uh, could 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 start to flow uh, in that area. So that was our prime focus. That was what um, had been identified as victim by victims and survivors as being uh, the key issue uh, for them. So that's where we have, of necessity, focused uh, our, uh, um, our, our efforts. And I think we have been very successful in launching this in the middle of a pandemic um, and uh, receiving applications. And I mentioned that the, uh, we now have what, uh, uh, over 900 applications. Um, and uh, we have um, payments, uh, made of uh, of 5.8 million and determinations worth 7.4 million so very significant progress has been made in that now that doesn't mean we weren't doing work on the other things um but uh, it did mean that 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 consumed the majority of our effort and i suppose in terms of priority that was the important thing to do to get the publicly funded scheme up in place because um, the commitment, the reason there was a publicly funded scheme was to make sure that none of the victims would be reliant on the outcome of any negotiations uh, with the institutions, because that would be unfair. So the public uh, funded scheme was always going to lead and be first. Uh, and the important thing now is the engagement we're having with the institutions to ensure that they make an appropriate contribution to defray that cost. But that regardless of the outcome of those negotiations, victims will still get the redress that was identified in the legislation that they are uh, entitled to, and that's what we've been focusing on. So we have set out a broad plan. Ministers are very keen to push this on, and we're now at the stage where um, this can be progressed uh, uh, more, more quickly. Okay, thank you, Mark. I, I mean, I was being incredibly sensitive and careful not to intertwine the two, but you did in your reply, so I'll try and disentangle them again. The establishment of the scheme, the payment, to, to survivors is absolutely critically important and is correct that it's the priority. But alongside that is this um, the recouping of uh, the, the money from the institution. So am I to take from your answer there that the individuals that are involved in recouping that money are also involved in the delivery of the scheme and therefore their time was busy for the first period setting that scheme up and that then once that's up and running, they can then move their attention to, to getting the money back from the institutions that's owed. Well, it's certainly it's it's the same uh, uh, branch in in the department uh, that, that Gareth leads that takes forward uh, the work in this area. But I don't want to give the impression it's all entirely sequential. You know, we have been doing some parallel work, but it's just that the key focus of what we have been doing has obviously been on the top priority, and the top priority has been getting the redress arrangements in place and ensuring that payments can start to flow. Uh, now that we're satisfied that that process has has settled down fairly well, and we've got over any teething problems, and you can see the flow of applications. 
conditions. There's still more work, a lot more work to be done making sure that that happens. But we can now shift some of our, our, our attention, our increased attention, I think, to looking at the other elements, which include, of course, uh, an apology, uh, which include uh, a memorial, which uh, the Kosica is, uh, the new Kosica Fiona Ryan is, is looking at, uh, and also includes the negotiation uh, with the institutions. Because uh, while this is important in terms of, of, of defraying the overall cost of the public purse, it's also important to victims that they see that the institutions are making uh, a contribution here. So it's important for that reason also. Um, but as I say, the first priority had to be getting the redress board up and we're now able to push on and, and make further progress on the engagement with the institutions. I, I, again, kind of take those points, Mark, but you know, we're specifically looking at one angle here today and, and one angle only. And it's just whenever you bring in all those additional uh, other issues uh, and put it all into the mix, I just wanted to make sure that, um, that you have the resource to be able to, to pursue um, the, this finance and that you have the, the people in place uh, but I'm going to take from your remarks that you can now divert your attention to that 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 will be something that will take place uh, moving forward um, Mark you had mentioned well, and we know from the report that there are six institutions um, that are involved in, in the process can I ask are you getting full and proper engagement from all six institutions or are you finding that any uh, of the institutions more difficult to engage with or difficult to include in any of the meetings or engagements? I think what I'll do there, I'll let Gareth actually take the lead in, in, in responding to that. He's been involved quite directly in these discussions. Gareth, do you want to just uh, respond to that one? Yes. Uh, in terms of engagement, um, there has not been any difficulty in getting uh, contact with the institutions or their representatives. Um, sometimes that is with the uh, members of the institutions themselves. Uh, sometimes it is with, with legal representatives or, or a mixture of the two. So um, certainly all the institutions have been, been willing to uh, come forward and to engage. Um, all have recognised that this is a critical issue um, and all have said that they will continue to um, engage with us uh, as we enter into discussions and negotiations. Uh, the other thing that we have been uh, keen to emphasise in those uh, discussions and those contacts uh, has been uh, the critical role that the institutions have in putting forward uh, information to the redress board. So every application that comes in, it gets sent to the, uh, the relevant institution. Uh, and again, there have been commitments uh, made on, on that. Um, uh, of course, alongside that, uh, the institutions um, are, are starting to raise uh, a number of issues from their uh, perspective, uh, as you would expect. Uh, one, for example, has been um, the contributions that they have already made in terms of uh, awards and in terms of services. Um, and uh, Hart's comment that uh, it would be inappropriate if, if institutions were asked to, to pay twice, uh, that has been raised. Um, and some have also been raising um, where their money is at, where their assets are at, um, for example, which may have been uh, invested into uh, nursing homes. Um, You'll have seen on that that one of the uh, principles that we want to uh, adopt for these negotiations uh, is a principle of uh, open book accounting. Um, and that's something that a, a number of the institutions have already acknowledged. Um, and we will be drawing in uh, legal and uh, financial expertise to, to help us as appropriate. Um, so, in, in uh, on, on the, the fact of getting engagement, uh, we are certainly getting engagement. Um, but there are issues that are uh, being raised um, that will need to be uh, drawn out in detail and, and got into in a lot of detail and at times challenged uh, as we go through the negotiations. Yeah, OK. I appreciate that it's early days yet. So the engagement might be good at the start, but could have the potential later down the line to be more difficult and that may impact. 
Um, just finally for myself then, are, are you finding, I mean, you're, a certain percentage of the cases will have gone through the redress board and, and awards have been made. Is there any impact at all on the overall projected budget from, you know, as you're seeing a pattern maybe emerging of the awards and the amount of money and, um, you know, just the number of cases and then looking forward at how many cases are going to come in. Is there any connection there or, or, or any patterns emerging, emerging there that might uh, directly correlate to the budget? Well, uh, against the, uh, we, we have been looking at some of the figures that have been emerging from the um, redress board and, and, and looking at that and tracking that against uh, the, our business case uh, uh, projections. Um, and it's still, it is still relatively early days. Um, for example, uh, in, in the, there was something like 190 or over 190 uh, applications in uh, December. So uh, these, th there, there was a sense that you know it takes a while for awareness of the scheme uh, to, to to percolate out more, more more widely. Then it takes time for the solicitors to draw the information together and make the applications. So and sometimes uh, the applications can be pulled together by a particular firm and then put in in bulk. So even even the the, the pattern isn't necessarily smooth, but we have, uh, as I said earlier on, over, over 900 applications uh, to, to date. Um, that's probably uh, probably a little lower than we would have envisaged in the business case, but um, it's difficult yet to see a clear pattern because we haven't yet got into the regular rhythm. We know that there are other applications that are held by the solicitors and so forth. We also, given that we launched in the uh, in the middle of the, the pandemic, right at the, well, right the start of the pandemic, uh, and we had to let the processes bed down, uh, we knew there would be uh, uh, sufficient applications and sufficient awareness uh, initially coming from the actual fact of the redress board opening. So we haven't yet um, put in place uh, substantial advertising uh, to, re to raise awareness, and that's something that we, we will be looking at uh, uh, over, over the coming period in order to, to broaden the awareness and, and to get that awareness uh, internationally and beyond. So that will uh, uh, act to increase the number of applications. So I'd say the flow of applications at the minute, it's hard to, it's hard to, I don't think they've settled down yet. We're still in the early stages. They're possibly a little bit behind where we had envisaged, but I think that that will change with the um, ad advertising. The other factor uh, was, is the level of awards. And again, we weren't sure what the level of awards were going to be. And at the moment, the average level of award is probably just slightly higher than the um, the figure that we had been using as our central estimate. Um, it's in the region of about thirty thousand um, pounds. And based on Lambeth, we've been using a figure somewhere in the region of about twenty six, twenty seven thousand. So those two factors at the moment are are sort of balance each other out a little bit. Okay. Okay. Thank Perhaps. you. Um, oh, sorry. Go on ahead. Just perhaps I could add briefly, Chair, that uh, I know one of the key areas for interest for Fiona Ryan as the new commissioner uh, is the, the uh, hidden victims may not be the, the, the right word, but um, people who are survivors of, of uh, institutional abuse of a harsh environment um, who are not in contact with survivors groups uh, and, and not on mailing lists and so on. Uh, and one of the key things that I know uh, Fiona wants to look at is how best uh, those people can be reached and we can make sure that they are uh, aware of the scheme. Okay, that's grand. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm going to pass to Doug Beatty to see. Yeah, Doug has his hand up there, and if we get him up into the spotlight, we'll get a question from Doug. Yeah, so thank you, um, Chair, and uh, Mark and Gareth, thank you very much for, for, for the information so far. I mean, this is a, a very narrow um, conversation, I've got to say, and I'm talking about talking to the various institutions, but there are many other issues in regards to this. Um, uh, and as the chair said, um, uh, we've met with the different victims and survivors groups, and they've identified uh, multiple issues that they're seeing, certainly around uh, redress and, and, and other issues. But today is a narrow um, uh, conversation. So yeah, it's just worth noting for, for anybody who's watching that, 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 that we're not dealing with all of the issues that we can see uh, as an issue at this moment in time. But can I just ask, please, that... Clearly, Judith Gillespie, who's the chairwoman of the Interdepartmental Working Group on Mothers and Baby Homes, has now 
said that it could be well in excess of 7,500 who are affected by that particular issue. And we know that there's a serious crossover between that and the HIA. Um, so the question is really twofold, and it's my only question. One is, where we've identified six institutions, are we looking to see if there is any more institutions that, that we may need to engage with when we get Judith Gillespie's report? Uh, and secondly, if she's right and that there is far more than 7,500 affected by this, um, are we looking at how we deal with the budget issues uh, it, whenever she comes up with her recommendations following her report? Well, I think there's a couple of points I'd make, and Gareth might want to come in uh, just further on those, uh, uh, Doug. I think the, the first point to make is that, of course, uh, we're not covering exactly uh, the same institutions, uh, and therefore the figures will not be exactly the same. Uh, in terms of, of our calculations around the business case, they were very difficult trying to get uh, uh, clear figures uh, for, for our, not just the six institutions. Those, those are the six main institutions that cover the bulk of, of uh, those that would have been affected, but they are, they are not all the institutions. Uh, and we sought to use data across all the institutions uh, and, and, and arriving at our, at our best estimate. Uh, and in the business case, we were looking at a figure of potentially 13,000 uh, victims coming forward. Um, so so quite quite a substantial number uh, of victims. And as Gareth has said, we, we, we do want to work to raise awareness of the scheme to ensure that all those who are entitled to come forward are, are aware that they are eligible and feel able to come forward. Um, so so uh, as I say, our, our figure is, is actually in excess of the figures that Judith Gillespie is talking about for the area that she's involved in. But Gareth has been uh, engaging with Judith Gillespie and may wish to say a little bit more about just the, the interaction between the two. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm certainly there is some uh, substantial interaction and uh, there are um, victims and survivors who have been uh, affected by experience of, of both of, of mother and baby homes um, and of uh, then institutional care as, as children. Um, the, the six institutions that we're focusing on for the, the particular purposes of uh, recovery of contributions are the six that were identified in the Hart report as uh, having systemic failings or, or where systemic abuse um, was able to take place. Uh, now, we're talking about six institutions. Um, there is a larger number of homes that were run by those institutions, but, but uh, uh, six institutions. Um, and the reason we're focusing on them was that finding from, from Hart. Um, uh, some of the uh, mother and baby homes uh, were run under the, the same institution institutions, but uh, uh, as Mark has said, we're, we're dealing with a different group and it will need to be considered uh, separately. Um, and certainly, I, I should also just note that uh, uh, the, the uh, issues of mother and baby homes and Magdalene Laundrie's uh, colleagues in the Department of Health uh, are first and foremost in the, the lead on those, uh, though in the Executive Office, given the cross-cutting issues, uh, we're taking a very keen interest and indeed ministers are, are uh, taking a very a keen interest in uh, these issues. Um, in, in terms of, of budget, um, any uh, consideration of um, what might happen in terms of the response to uh, the report on mother and baby homes that's um, due to be published before the, the end of the month, um, any de decisions on that um, would need to come to the executive uh, separately. Uh, but uh, and, and um, so the, there would be separate questions about budget and so on um, that might come further down the line. Um, but uh, no, in, in, in terms of the links, because we've got a shared uh, interdepartmental working group on uh, mother and baby homes, Magdalene laundries, and historical clerical child abuse. Um, there has been a lot of contact between the two departments. Um, I, hopefully, we've been able to pass on something of uh, our experience on on HIA, which has been helpful. Uh, we're certainly learning some uh, some uh, new things, um, and uh, I have to say there has not been uh, a day in 
recent weeks when I haven't been on the phone uh, at least once with my opposite number in the, the Department of Health um, to make sure that our responses to all of this are joined up and we're learning from each other. And, and, and thank you for that. And, and, and I guess the whole point of why I asked that question is, is purely in the issue of crossover by an individual who is actually then involved in pretty much both of these issues, be it the, 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 the uh, mother and baby homes uh, and the, the sort of clerical historical uh, abuse. I mean, what I wouldn't want to see, for an example, is one of the survivors to have to go through two separate processes. You know, if, 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 there, if there's a crossover here, there, there needs to be some sort of system where an individual can go through a single process um, but be able to address all of the, the, the issues. If you understand what I, what I mean, I, I mean, that might be a, a small number, it might be a lot, but, but there's certainly crossover between the, between the two. And, and Gareth, I've got to say, I mean, if you're talking at length to the Department for Health, then, then I applaud that and, that, and that's great. It's the, it's the outworkings of it, it's to make sure that we're not, for example, having to do a background check on an individual survivor twice, you know, um, where there's a where there's a where there's a clear crossover between the two the two different the two different issues. If that makes sense, uh, it does. Um, these, as say, are questions that will need to be uh, explored down the line in light of any in light of the. Um, research report that's published and uh, in light of the executive's decisions on, on, on foot of it. Um, but, but certainly any of our conversations um, are about uh, you know, how, how can we provide the kind of support um, that victims and survivors need and how can we take an approach uh, which is very much um, engaged with um, uh, victims and survivors and responding to their needs. I think also just to Thank add, you. Uh, uh, Doug, um, the other area of crossover is those who were uh, under 18 and who, who were in those institutions, the, the, the mother and baby homes, they are already eligible uh, to apply under the, the the heart scheme, if you want to call it the heart scheme. Uh, so they are already eligible and they can come forward and they can they can have their case dealt with uh, under, under, under that scheme already. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, I'm going to bring uh, Pat in next, but maybe just before Pat does come in, uh, it's not just as big an issue now, but the next presentation we will have four uh, people that are uh, part of the panel. So maybe one of your, uh, the first question will probably go to whoever's leading uh, to, to lead, but if afterwards in the questions, if you can kind of direct your question to whoever it is that you need to answer, because um, otherwise you could have three or four people jump in to answer a question at the same time. So. Um, but Pat, we'll pass over to yourself then for a question. Okay, thanks, Joe, and, and thanks to Mark and Gareth uh, for your presentation. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, first of all, is there any indicative timeline for the discussions with the institutions? Uh, and secondly, uh, has there been any calculation as to what percentage of the redress fund should be picked up by the institutions and what percentage by the taxpayer. That's all, thanks. Okay, well, uh, Pat, in, in, in relation to the uh, the, the timeline, uh, ministers have set, have set out the timeline for the initial engagements. Uh, we hope to have those completed by, by the end of February, and then we want to get into more intensive uh, discussions uh, around that. There's no firm time frame has been set for that. I think that will be dictated by the sort of response that we get uh, in the initial uh, uh, meetings, and we'll have to just uh, work through those initial issues. But ministers are very keen that this is progressed uh, as quickly as possible. And I think it's in everyone's interest that, that that is the case. So we will certainly be trying to progress the, the negotiations as quickly uh, as, as we can. Uh, again, in terms of uh, what the relative uh, liability might be between uh, the different uh, uh, elements, that is something that, again, is going to be a key part um, of the discussions. And we'll have to look at what the methodology will be for uh, de determining that. But we haven't, at this point, um, come to a, or, or a, a, a particular conclusion on what that apportionment uh, ought, ought, ought to be. Gareth, do you want to add anything to, to that? 
Uh, yeah, just, it's, it's a point that is uh, brought out in the paper before the committee. Um, but uh, while clearly we want to uh, get this process started urgently and uh, uh, we want to get some commitments as, as soon as we can, uh, one of the learning points from the uh, Ryan uh, redress scheme uh, in the South was that uh, well, I think there the the, the settlements were reached with the institutions uh, before the full impact of the redress scheme and the full cost of the redress scheme uh, was known. Um, so uh, bearing in mind that this is a scheme where applications are, are open for, for five years, uh, there is something about uh, not finally closing down the negotiations too soon, and, and that's been uh, a, a learning point. But that's not to say, as we've said in the paper, uh, that you couldn't be looking at payments on account or, or part payments or annual contributions uh, or something that would uh, uh, demonstrate the commitment of the institutions at this point in time. Um, and uh, just to, to reassure that the uh, redress board uh, has committed that it will provide us with information broken down uh, on an institution by institution basis uh, in terms of, of numbers of cases and uh, amounts that have been paid. Um, so that that gives us some uh, starting point in the negotiations. Okay, thanks for that. And and I understand, given the nature of this scheme, it's impossible to be precise about how much it's uh, it's actually going to cost. But what what are the ballpark figures that are being discussed? Well, in terms of the uh, the 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 central estimate part that we had included in our business case, and you'll remember some very long discussions we had at some previous uh, committee meetings where I was setting out some of the uncertainties and the, the fact that we had to have a range um, of costs, uh, and 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 we do have a range that goes from somewhere uh, in, in the region of just over a uh, hundred million pounds to over four hundred million pounds to uh, well in, in in excess of that. But our central estimate is that um, it would be somewhere in the region of about 400 million pounds or, or just over it. Um, so that's, but again, we don't know until we see the numbers that come forward and we don't know until we see what the, the average uh, uh, rate of settlement is. And again, that was an issue in the South where uh, I think the, uh, from my understanding of what happened there was um, the, 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 the numbers were much more than the government had anticipated, but perhaps not much more than the religious institutions had anticipated. Um, and uh, that whole point that Gareth made about the early decision being made about the contribution was one that, that was very prob problematic because the numbers turned out to be much greater than I think the government down there had uh, anticipated. Yeah, and, and I understand given the, the difficulties in estimating what a final figure would be. Uh, and in terms of estimating the liability for each of the organisations is, is also going to be difficult. But is there uh, roughly any idea of what the percentage contribution would be of the institutions collectively? We haven't got to that point, uh, uh, Pat, in, in looking at this, because part of this we, 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 we will have to look at is um, what the, uh, the as, as Gareth said, trying to get information on, on, on the uh, extent of the issues relating to each institution. And we will have that information from the uh, redress board on an ongoing basis it will change uh, over, over 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 time so getting some sense of of the 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 uh, amount of cost to the state that has arisen from an institution i think will be helpful uh, then the issue becomes about culpability and how much uh, of that cost ought, ought to be attributed to the institution or in, to other, other factors, including the state at the time and what the state's responsibilities were. And I envisage that being a fairly interesting discussion uh, with the institutions when, when we get into that. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Pat. We're going to pass now to um, Trevor. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Mark and uh, Gareth, for your information. I, I do have concerns about the, the level of cooperation or potential cooperation with the institutions as this thing unrolls, because they, at the moment when you're, you're talking about payments made of, well, determinations of 7.3 million, but a potential cost, according to whatever estimate you look at, of between 100 million and 400 million, um, I, I suspect it wouldn't be very long 
And I think I picked up on one of your your <coughs> your, your statements there that perhaps some of the institutions already were doubting their capacity to to, to pay in the longer term. So is is this if, if we do get that situation, um, can, is there a compulsion involved here? I mean, can can the government compel, even by legal action, these uh, institutions to come forward with the money? Or is it just a case of uh, mediation or binding arbitration if they agree to it? Well, uh, initially, um, Trevor, what we will be following is what the recommendation was in heart, which is to have the uh, negotiation uh, to see if we can reach uh, agreement. Uh, then, if that's not possible, um, to move to mediation, and then Hart had recommended uh, uh, binding arbitration. We will also be seeking to get uh, as clear as clear a picture as we can of what the actual institution's reserves uh, and financial situation is, and and. Uh, Gareth mentioned that we would be seeking to get um, uh, expertise, legal expertise uh, in that area and have an open book accounting approach to this. Um, it, it, and, and in some cases, it, it, these things are not straightforward. Um, I think the experience in the South was that land was handed over uh, in part payment and of course the, the value of land uh, then plummeted at that particular point. I think also there were some homes, uh, uh, old people's homes that, that were handed over and then the state found it was really expensive to run, run them and actually handed at least one of them back. So we have to be careful about, about just um, what sort of assets we would count, how we would count them uh, and uh, how uh, uh, that, that would contribute towards the overall cost. Uh, we, we will want to discuss uh, um, and consider further just what would happen uh, if there uh, it was an agreement to binding arbitration and, and if agreement couldn't be reached. But I hope we won't get to that point and, and, and all the, indicate, the early indications uh, from the institutions uh, has been um, positive, as Gareth mentioned. They have been cooperative in terms of providing information. They have they have engaged, uh, and at this point, we we would be uh, want want to proceed in hope uh, that we will be able to uh, achieve uh, an agreed outcome. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, just two small points then. But you, you did mention what happened in the south over the transfer of assets as opposed to cash. Uh, would, would the way to deal with that not be, I'm sure the House South would agree with hindsight, that it would have been a better idea to get them to sell the assets and hand over the money? Well, that's certainly one, one approach uh, to this. And that, again, that's, that all has to be part of our considerations in the, in the negotiations and uh, some assessment of, of uh, how best to realise uh, uh, the, the contribution from the institutions. The last one, I, I may have asked you this before, but is it possible or do we know if some of these institutions may have had or may have insurance cover to deal with these situations? Has that been explored? I think you did ask that question before, and I think Gareth answered it, so I'm, I'm going to let Gareth give the answer again. <laughs> it is a question that I have asked. Now, not all the institutions, but uh, I certainly uh, did ask one or two um, who uh, told me no, there wasn't uh, insurance cover that would would cover this, um, that would cover these kind of contributions. Um, so I, we, we will certainly take it up again in the course of the uh, further discussions with the institutions, but um, the initial signal seemed to be that that wasn't necessarily going to be a fruitful line of inquiry, unfortunately. Yeah, um, I, th I think you may find in other jurisdictions around the world that in fact insurance may have existed. And it doesn't really matter how long ago the uh, abuse may have happened, it could still apply, you know. So I think you shouldn't, shouldn't forget about that aspect of it. It would certainly make it a lot easier for them to, to come up with the, what, what's required, if necessary. No, certainly, uh, certainly we will take it up again. Uh, I say just the initial uh, questions were being answered in the negative, but uh, we certainly haven't lost sight of it as a possibility. One of the, sorry, Chair, okay. one of the principles of liability insurance, going by my days in the business, would be that if somebody made a liability claim against you, whether for straightforward injury or professional negligence or whatever, you, you never admitted <laughs> immediately either that you, you accepted liability or even that you had insurance cover for it. 
because it's an open invitation in terms of the insurance company's attitude to provoke a claim. So if they said no, absolutely not, that's one thing. If they said we don't think so, that's a different thing. And they may need to search their archives a bit. Well, yeah, again, that's something we'll follow through, Trevor. All right, thank you. Some insider information there to the mechanisms of the insurance trade there, um, Trevor. We'll uh, pass over to Christopher. Thank you, and thank you for your answers uh, thus far. I mean, it's, it's patently obvious that the reason why they, the authority, the churches rather, settled quicker in the Republic of Ireland because they were equipped with the knowledge of the scale of the abuse that was going on to a much greater degree than the state was. And therefore, they were keen to basically settle quickly before the true scale of the, the problems emerged. The institutions, I would submit, are in a better position to know the scale of the abuse and the scale of the number of complaints that, have, that were submitted about the conduct of clergy or staff uh, who were in their employ. I'm just wondering, have, in terms of your experience of that information being forthcoming, have they been cooperative? I think they're, uh, sorry, Mark. Well, I, I, no, you, you, you go ahead and I'll come in afterwards, Gareth, if there's anything else to say. No, I was just going to say the, the, the sequencing of whole, how this has all uh, come about has been different here than uh, in the, the Republic. And uh, in the Republic, they were dealing with the, the inquiry, with the Ryan inquiry, and dealing with the uh, redress. Some of that happened in parallel. Some of these negotiations with the uh, institutions happened in, in parallel. Um, we have the advantage that we do have the Hart report, um, and that was an inquiry that had powers to compel uh, and powers to require the, the production of, of evidence. Um, so I think we're going in um, with our eyes uh, open. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I don't disagree that this is something that we need to uh, keep in mind and, uh, and be very careful of and say that it, it, it feeds into the <laughs> It's in the paper um, that, that the final settlement um, is not likely to be until uh, the, the final instalment is not likely to be until further down the line uh, when we have a pretty firm idea of uh, what is coming into the redress board. Uh, one of the things with these, these schemes, um, you do sometimes find there's a bit of a rush towards the end. Um, that has been the experience elsewhere. So that's something we want to have very much in mind too. Um, I mean, the report that was recently produced about mother and baby homes just demonstrated a scale of just callous cruelty that I think is unimaginable or would have been unimaginable before that report was produced. Like a 15% infant mortality rate in those homes. Like that is a worse infant mortality rate than in some of the poorest parts of the world. And I think it just demonstrates that the scale of the problem. When you got to a situation where it was revealed in the Republic that it was revealed that dead babies, their bodies were being stored in a tank. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable that the sheer scale of the cruelty. And I know that these institutions operate regardless of the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. So I expect when the investigation is concluded here that we will find similar levels of cruelty and, and barbarism. That being the case, have you witnessed any evidence, as has happened in other parts of the world, the United States is a good example of this, have you witnessed any evidence of these institutions attempting to shield their assets? Because uh, I could direct you to an article that was in Bloomberg uh, this time last year, where it's estimated that the Catholic Church in the United States of America moved to shield almost $2 billion worth of assets in order to prevent victims from getting access to that money. Um, and I'm just wondering, have you seen any evidence of, say, um, you know, assets being transferred to trusts or things like that in order to prevent people from getting access to them? 
Well, I think, uh, Chris, just to come, I think it, that's, it's, it's a bit early for us to have ident- identified that at this stage. We started the process of negotiating with the with the institutions. Part of the principle around that has been around the uh, uh, a principle of, of transparency and open book accounting. Okay. We have mentioned that we are seeking to get to, to acquire expertise and bring expertise into those negotiations that will help us with that open book accounting. And I think uh, it, it would be through that process that uh, we'd get a better sense of the extent of um, um, assets and so forth and any of the things that you you, you are uh, describing. So I think it's just a little early for us to be aware of any of those particular uh, issues. The other point I, w- I would make is that um, we will have to deal with all of the institutions uh, uh, separately, essentially, because they are all separate and independent institutions. Uh, certainly, in the in the Catholic sector, all of the the ins, ins, institutions have their own identity and their own legal identity. And um, there's also the diocesan aspect looked after by the the bishops. And then, of course, we have the Church of Ireland. And then, of course, we also have Bernardos. Um, but there's the so so it, this is going to be very complex. Um, but we will certainly be be trying to make sure we have the expertise that will enable us to investigate the kind of things that you've just described to make sure we get the best sense of what assets are available and to to be put towards any uh, agreed contributions. That's where, I mean, frankly, the strictures of diocesan, the diocesan boundaries or uh, canon law, I, I don't care about them. And if I see evidence, if we see evidence, that assets are being that, that there's attempts being made to shield assets, we should not hesitate to use whatever legal powers are open to us to prevent that. Because the niceties of church structures or what have you are utterly irrelevant to me in terms of uh, my considerations here. Just final um, uh, question in terms of the um, the numbers. Uh, you suggest you indicated numbers were slightly lower than you had expected um, at this point. I'm just wondering what steps are going to be made in terms of just making people aware of the the scheme being open and, and what have you. Yes, well, I think what I was saying, uh, Chris, was that we, when we looked at this, we were very uncertain about what, about what numbers were out there and how many would uh, come forward, because not every victim uh, or survivor uh, will, will, will want to come forward and make it known that they have suffered in this way, as we know. So, our, I mean, our estimates varied. We had, we had three different uh, uh, variants of this. Uh, from around 5,000 uh, to just over 13,000, which is, a, is our central sort of estimate, the one that we've been using to over uh, to, to up to 16,000. Um, so um, in terms of the numbers coming forward again, um, we, we weren't able to establish a clear profile about how many will come forward in year one, year two, year three, year four, and year five. Yeah. So it, it's hard to know whether you know we we are on track or, or, or slightly behind track. But at the moment, if you we we have just over 900, 959 or something, I think app, app, applications. So it's, that's almost a thousand in the. Um, in the first year, applications are open for five years, and the whole process, uh, including pay, pay, payments for ten years. Um, so uh, we think that we're maybe they've been a little slower at the outset. That's probably uh, not surprising as people get used to the system, as solicitors get used to the system, uh, as they start processing, gathering the information. All those systems start to get put in place, and I would expect that those systems will get smoother. People become more familiar with it, and applications will start to come through a bit more quickly. The second bit is is the aspect that you mentioned about about raising awareness, and I'll let Gareth just say a little bit about what our plans are around raising awareness. Uh, we, we had some experience of this uh, in regard to the inquiry uh, we, where we were raising awareness about the uh, existence of the inquiry and encouraging people who wanted to come forward to it or to the acknowledgement forum to, to come forward. Um, and there was publicity that was done across a, a range of, of media for that. And so we have that experience to, to draw on. Uh, of course, since then, there's been uh, more of an explosion in terms of social media. Uh, and I think will be uh, another area of potential for us in terms of, of reaching people. But I'm, I'm very interested to see where uh, the commissioners work on 
identifying where victims are and how best to reach them. Uh, very interesting to see the results of that, uh, and it'll guide us very much in where we should be targeting the, the publicity. Of course, within TEO, we do have some uh, tools at our disposal as well, uh, and uh, our Washington office has already offered, if there is any help they can give in getting word out to uh, groups in uh, in the States, um, that uh, they'd be very happy to, to be involved in that. Um, you mentioned the, the cross-border nature of a number of these institutions, and uh, as you just say, uh, I'm looking ahead here, particularly to, to, to work on Mother and Baby Hope. Uh, First Minister, Deputy First Minister, had a meeting with Minister O'Gorman uh, in the South earlier today, uh, and that was an opportunity to uh, explore continued liaison uh, on some of these uh, issues between the, the two jurisdictions. And, and that has regard to the, the cross-border nature of where records are uh, held, the cross-border nature of adoptions and, and, and so on. Um, and, and finally, just uh, when you uh, rightly put uh, victims and survivors at the, the centre of this, um, and uh, uh, you know it's all very easy to speak about numbers and institutions and, and so on. Um, it, it, it is very telling uh, when uh, any of us are in uh, meetings with with um, victims and survivors, um, some of the experiences that are, are shared. Uh, and I think they, uh, along with the likes of the uh, Mother and Baby Homes report and the experiences that, that are shared there, um, bring home to us all why this work is important uh, and we need to keep going at it. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your presentation. This is um, an incredibly difficult area, uh, and I think in some ways talking about it in terms of the, the financial side of it is, a, is a, an even more uh, you know, a different type of difficulty as well. And, and we'd certainly appreciate the work that's ongoing uh, and look forward to future engagement with you as we move forward um, to uh, find out, just get the updates on how you're getting on. Um, so look, we're going to we we'll leave it there. Um, I think we're going to do a bit of a jig round in terms of uh, panel. I think we're going to lose Gareth, keep Mark, and pick up a few extras. Yeah. So, uh, in our virtual uh, enter and exit of the room, um, you, uh, I don't know if it's in order or not, but uh, could I suggest we go into closed session for a couple of minutes? Yes, I think. The communications team will be having a meltdown, but <laughs> um, I think um, that we can certainly, if you're proposing that, and if there's no other yeah, objections right. to that, then um, could I ask the communications team just to arrange for us to pop into closed session for a moment? It'll probably take just about a minute or so for that to be uh, mm -hmm. arranged. Yeah, I think we just no, because then I don't think people can. All oh, right, okay. Uh... Can I just let you know I was trying to get into that section but couldn't get in, so I uh, wasn't able to unmute myself, and I didn't know how you could get your attention. So if we could find a way of uh, letting you know, and then some of us want to ask a question, but to you know. Okay. Same. So sorry. At the start of the meeting, we had said that if anybody's looking to come in, I'm not going to. I'm sorry. I'm just making this a, a ruling from the chair. I'm not going around all nine members to ask them do they want to ask a question because it'll actually prompt everybody to do it. So there is a raise hand function on your actual computer screen, and if you click the raise hand, it brings up a blue symbol beside your name at the desk, and then I know to call you in. So Doug did that. Pat did that and then the ones in the room indicated. But if you could do that, because I, I know myself from being a member of a committee, if somebody asks you, do you want to ask a question, you will. And if we go round all nine, then every presentation will end up with, with that. So um, if you move your mouse, on the, it'll bring up the screen, all of the functions. There is a little picture of a yellow hand. If you click on that, it changes from yellow to blue, and then it brings it up on the screen here beside your name, so I know to call you in. Um, apologies, you that instruction. Yep. 
Okay. Um, I just want to <coughs> confirm maybe with somebody uh, with communication just that I need to press the red button for uh, and okay. 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, uh, thank you very much, members, for just taking that um, slight closed session for a moment or two. We'll be able to move back now and uh, move on to the next element of the agenda, which is item six, and it is the Executive Office work strands under New Decade, New Approach. Page 25 of the meeting pack and uh, page three of the tabled meeting pack, uh, we have the correspondence from the Executive Office informing us uh, that the Executive has agreed uh, to proceed with the public consultation phase uh, of the programme for government based on the new draft outcomes framework as well. Um, the consultation document at page four of the table packs has not yet been published and will go live on the 25th of January. So we'll, um, maybe if members are content, we will also seek uh, an oral briefing from the department on the programme for government at a later stage in the consultation, whenever it's opened up and there's some sense of the feedback that's coming from that. Would members be happy enough? Christopher agrees with us. So um, then we'll move them um, on to the presentation. And we have um, Chris Stewart, just to give him his title, is the Director for Programme for Government and Civil Service of the Future from the Executive Office. Mark Brown is back with us again. We also have Siobhan Broderick, who is Assistant Secretary of Strategic Policy, Equality and Good Relations. I'm Geoffrey Simpson, who is Head of Programme for Government and NICS of the Future. Um, the session is live and been recorded, and Hansard will have a transcript. Maybe if we could pass over to yourself. Uh, then, Chris, if you want to take the lead and do a presentation, then we can open up to questions from members. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members. Yes, I'm happy to kick off. And then perhaps Mark and Siobhan will come in on a couple of key issues uh, that they cover within NDNA. Chair, if it meets with your approval, I thought I'd begin just with a very brief outline of the position overall on NDNA uh, and touching on PFG as well, uh, as you have, and then run through a number of the actions that fall to my side of the department namely ministerial codes, ministerial standards, the Brexit subcommittee of the executive, the compact civic advisory panel. And I'll mention in passing just the uh, graduate entry medical school, uh, just to clear up perhaps a little bit of uh, confusion around that. And of course, uh, PFG itself. So beginning chair with the overview, uh, my goodness, the NDNA has just had uh, its first anniversary, uh, which snuck up uh, on all of us. It's a complex and challenging agreement. We always viewed it, I think, from the outset as requiring more than one mandate for delivery. And of course, the PFG is one of the key delivery mechanisms. And as members will know, much of the planning for delivery, particularly in the early days, was uh, extremely disrupted by COVID. And we'll say a little bit more about that when we come to the PFG specifically. But overall, there are three mechanisms for the governance of delivery of NDNA. Firstly, there's a joint board, which is convened by the Secretary of State and involves First Minister and Deputy First Minister. That has met twice so far, and I understand is going to meet again uh, later this month. And it's... Sorry, Sorry Chair. The thing popped up on my computer. Sorry. Yeah. So it's okay. Christopher, something come up, come up on his uh, screen there. He wasn't calling you stupid, Chris. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> Absolutely not. not get, he wouldn't not be yet. the first chair, and, and many would agree. <laughs> Go on ahead, Chris. But it usually comes at the end of the presentation rather than the minute. Uh, chair, I was just saying there, there are three mechanisms for the, the governance of delivery. The, the first is a joint board, uh, which I think is due to meet again uh, later this month. And the key focus of the joint board is uh, on assurance on the funding associated with the NDNA, particularly the funding streams around transformation in uh, health and education. The second mechanism is the party leaders forum, and that's a political mechanism, so officials are not involved, but it has been established and I understand it has met uh, a number of times in recent months. 
Thirdly, there's the formal implementation review. Those are envisaged to be quarterly, but again, disrupted by COVID. Uh, there has only been one so far uh, last week, in fact, the week before, convened jointly by the UK uh, and Irish governments. Um, the key NDNA work stream that falls to my side of the department is, of course, the PFG. Uh, and members are aware the executive agreed uh, just before Christmas to commence the public consultation that you just referred to on a new draft outcomes framework. Um, in line with NDNA, we'll seek to build on the outcomes-based approach that we've been following uh, since 2016. And there'll be a new set of outcomes that picks up on the lessons learned <coughs> and takes account of the priorities identified in NDNA and through the talks process that, that led to it. It won't surprise members to know that work on the PFG was disrupted uh, to a very great extent by COVID, two major effects. Firstly, we had to divert uh, all of our available resource. So Jeffrey and his team, until comparatively recently, actually have been working on COVID matters uh, and not on the PFG. And of course, the executive itself uh, had its bandwidth largely used up uh, by, by COVID matters. So in fact, we've only really got back to the day job uh, on the PFG within the last couple of months. <coughs> and that means trying to compress uh, a 12-month timetable into around about six months. That's very challenging and we're a little bit behind, but we think we're just about on course to publish Programme for Government itself uh, before the summer. So that follows on from a fairly intensive round of uh, engagement with stakeholders that we completed at the back end of last year. And then as we move ahead, the, the intention is for that public consultation and engagement on the revised draft outcomes framework to commence next Monday uh, and last for eight weeks. So we're glad that we're able to, to get that draft outcomes framework uh, to you now because we very much welcome the opportunity to engage with the committee alongside the, the public consultation. <coughs> and we're more than happy to come back, Chair, for that oral evidence uh, session uh, that you suggested uh, and look forward to, to doing so. A number of other strands of NDNA which fall to my side of the department as well, and I'll run through them. Firstly, on ministerial codes. Now, that's a bit of work that's split between ourselves and colleagues in the Department of Finance. On the TEO side, the governance, uh, or the guidance, I should say, governing the operation of the executive remains substantively current, although certain aspects have had to change uh, to, to recognize the, the change in practice in, re, in re, relation to the frequency of meetings and the change to a virtual format. And we take a further opportunity at an appropriate point to review that guidance and consolidate any lessons learned or indeed permanent changes that have to be made. Associated with that, the revised Ministerial Code of Conduct was agreed by the Executive in March of last year, and as a statutory code, that needs to be reflected uh, in amendments in Westminster legislation, which will also deal with some other aspects uh, of NDNA. Uh, just for completeness, on the Department of Finance side, members are probably aware uh, Special Advisor Codes were agreed and published in January of last year, uh, and the requirement for publication of ministerial meetings and special advisor gifts and, and hospitality uh, has been met. Uh, those have now been published. And in addition to that, uh, an NICS code of ethics has been revised to include a requirement on officials to maintain accurate written records, including minutes of ministerial meetings. Um, the rights and responsibilities of civil servants under <coughs> the code have also been revised to make clear the obligation to give proper consideration to concerns raised by colleagues and those outside the, the service that's longhand for whistleblowers. Um, the final draft of the Code of Ethics we expect to be taken to the Executive shortly. Also on ministerial standards, there's some work that falls uh, on our side. Um, the Executive adopted guidance for ministers in the exercise of their functions in March, and that supports the Ministerial Code of Conduct. And there will be further amendments describing the role of a minister. Those have been recommended, uh, and we expect those to go to the Executive for agreement in the near future. And alongside that, a specification for the appointment of members of the Ministerial Standards Panel has been prepared, and some discussions have taken place with the Office of the Commissioner for Public Appointments in relation to initiating the competition for that in the near future, and also discussions with the Assembly Commissioner for Standards in respect of the role uh, proposed for her. Other issues, Chair, following to us, uh, the proposal for a Brexit subcommittee of the Executive. And the Executive has agreed that that subcommittee should be replaced, a uh, slightly different mechanism, known as the Executive Committee Considering EU Exit Matters. 
and the terms of reference for that committee have been placed in the Assembly Library. The Compact Civic Advisory Panel uh, is another piece of work that's been affected by COVID, uh, so we're running a bit behind on that. But preliminary scoping work has been undertaken on a specification for public appointments competition. And uh, on foot of that, we need to consider how and at what point the forum could best contribute effectively to public engagement and the key aspects of the executive's policy agenda, particularly, I think, uh, in the current circumstances. Finally, Chair, on the Graduate Entry Medical School, uh, listed in our paper uh, as a, a TEO action, uh, but that's no longer the case. The TEO role in that is, is now complete, uh, and the lead falls to our colleagues in the Department of the Economy and Department of Health. <clears throat> and on the DFE side, uh, the good news is their view is it's achieved or substantially on target and following the executive approval of funding uh, on the 9th of July last year. Ulster University has commenced the recruitment process for students uh, and the intention is uh, that, that will we'll get underway in September of this year. Chair, that's a very quick run through a number of things. I'm happy to pause and take questions on that now, perhaps particularly around the PFG or to hand over to, to Mark and Siobhan as, as you see fit. Okay, um, Chris, thanks very much indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's a very wide ranging area and there are plenty of um, topics and issues in it. I will begin with a few questions, but maybe what I would ask now is if any member wishes to ask a question that they indicate by uh, raising their hand on the, the electronic hand uh, on the, the system so that I can see that they want to ask a question. Um, I suppose one of the, the, the key areas, um, Chris, from that, that caused the collapse of the institutions was the issue of an Irish Language Act and the uh, whole issue of identity that then was was fleshed out and discussed and was raised as part of MDNA. Um, I think that there, you know, there is still some sort of reputational matters to be considered there insofar as it, it was the issue that brought the place down for three years and in reality we haven't really heard much on any of that stream in the past year. Um, the detail within that, that report that we've received from yourselves, which was pre-Christmas, is a bit vague on it. And we have asked questions previous uh, of the, the ministers and are told that you, you know, there will be some elements of it in 2021-22 uh, and that it will happen during this mandate. But could we nail down what are the exact timelines uh, for the introduction of that whole package uh, of identity uh, legislation and can you give me a flavour of any of the interactions that have been taking place thus far? Say, for example, I mean, you'll be doing various engagements with different organisations, such as, for example, the Human Rights Commission. I mean, have the, are those sort of levels of engagement in preparation for the legislation taking place already? Or are they taking place at the moment? Uh, is there a timetable for them going forward? And when might we see the first stage of the... the um, the, the, the legislation make its way to the floor of the Assembly? Chair, with your permission, I'll defer to Mark and Siobhan on that. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks thank Chris. Uh, I'll I, I make some initial comments and then I think Siobhan can come in with the, uh, the detail uh, on this, Chair. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, within the, the new decade, new uh, uh, approach, there was the commitment to um, establish uh, an Office for Identity and Cultural Expression and also to uh, uh, to bring forward the appointment of an Irish language commissioner uh, and the appointment of a commissioner that would develop the um, language arts and literature associated with the Ulster Scots and Ulster British tradition uh, here. And there were draft bills uh, appended to that um, uh, agreement. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, uh, was is a substantial additional uh, aspect of work for the executive office. And uh, we established uh, uh, an additional division to put some resource uh, to taking all of that forward uh, and, 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 and to try and make pro progress on that. And Siobhan uh, uh, was moved over to, to head that up. And we have staff that as best we can uh, to ensure that um, progress can be made uh, around all of this. Um, Siobhan can give you uh, some more detail about the nature of the engagement. But what I would say is that we are continuing to work uh, uh, to do the preparatory work around this, to legislate for the core elements of the of the rights language and identity proposals, 
that the Minister's intention is to progress the legislation during this mandate, and the First and Deputy First have made that uh, clear on a number of occasions, both with the committee and in the response to Assembly questions, and then to create the relevant bodies as soon as possible uh, there, thereafter. So that is the, the current position on that. Siobhan, you might say, want to say a little bit more about some of the engagements that there have been around aspects of this. So, Chair, as Mark has said, uh, ministers have said on a number of occasions, more recently, I think, for yourselves last week, that they are committed to bringing forward the three bills appended to the NDNA during this mandate. And as Mark said, he has set up a, a small division, which I lead, and has other responsibilities other than RLI. And during this time, we have been doing preparatory work, which has involved the sort of the preliminary assessments in respect of the impact of the proposed bills, regulatory equality, rural, et cetera, uh, preparing the supplementary documentation that you need to bring forward bills like the explanatory memorandum and the financial memorandum. Um, we have engaged with DSO and the Office of Legislative Council in respect of the processes that we need to follow. We've engaged with the DSE language branches. As you know, language policy is led by the Department for Communities, and they're obviously bringing forward the strategies for the Irish language in Ulster Scots. Um, so we have is with them and back to the ground trying to bring forward an early engagement with human engagement with the Equality Commission. But our focus uh, with a relatively small team that has been impacted by COVID over the last few months is really doing the work that we need to have in hand for the bills to go into the Assembly. Uh, and that has been our focus. Okay, uh, we, we lost a little bit just at the end of what you said. Oh, sorry. There. Siobhan, no, that's okay. It's okay. We got the majority of, of, of what you had said there, I suppose. Um, there's a little bit more information in there in terms of that sort of preparatory work that's been done. But, you know, I suppose the concern is just that you, you, you rightly pointed out that last week the First and Deputy First Minister said that it's their intention to deliver it during this mandate um, and that work is ongoing. But equally, that's what we heard six or seven months ago from them. So there's been no change in the information coming from them, which doesn't instill an awful lot of confidence that something is moving forward. So um, some of that information that you give, that there, there is engagement and that there is preparatory work being done, hopefully uh, will highlight that there is going to be some movement and that we will um, see the introduction soon of, of those bills. Because one thing, for example, we talk about... Uh, identity and it's always considered in a binary uh, sense uh, for Northern Ireland and, and, and yet uh, when we look out and look around our communities there certainly mm -hmm. isn't binary identity there is much more uh, than a binary identity and, and I hope that as this bill develops that we don't put too much emphasis uh, on simply two identities and two traditions and miss the fact that our society has many many more all of them need to be recognised and supported um, Chris, you had mentioned about the, um, the civic advisory panel, and again, I appreciate that there is um, that COVID is there, but you know the, the the sort of population of that panel, which was to be done through an open sort of network, an open process to get people on board and involved. You know, can you tell me again about the time scales there? Because you know, companies, civil service. Right, right round society, people are able to go out and recruit and they've adjusted to COVID and the way that they need to, to move forward. Um, many conferences are held online and people are able to get involved and participate. So I think the, the, the COVID issue as an explanation uh, for something not happening is starting to, to lose its currency somewhat. And when we look at the process of COVID and the actual engagement uh, of, of, of civic society, and whenever regulations and rules were coming in and civ you know, civic society was able to stand up and say, no, we don't like this or we do like that or we want to see the other, there's been great engagement with community uh, and, and, and individuals. And I think that the civic advisory panel uh, could do a great deal of work in dealing with many, many issues that we face here in the north. So could you give me some sense of the timescales for, for the um, processes and as best we can not use COVID as, a, as an excuse, but find ways to work around that to engage with people? Chair, your point is a fair one. Uh, and apologies if I gave you the impression that I was offering COVID as an excuse for, for, for not engaging. 
you're absolutely right. Uh, here we are meeting virtually today. We actually did all of the stakeholder engagement on the program for government before Christmas uh, virtually. Uh, we're now regularly having uh, appointment processes uh, and uh, job interviews uh, using using virtual platforms. So you're absolutely right. COVID is not a reason for for not engaging. No, what I meant was, and perhaps it just wasn't clear on it. Um, the disruption was simply the additional workload on 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 TEO uh, around COVID. Uh, the part of TEO that will be taking forward the work on, on the uh, advisory panel is the executive secretariat size. We can imagine their workload has increased dramatically with the increased frequency um, of the executive meetings uh, and everything that's going on uh, around that. So it was simply a workload effect. It wasn't the nature of COVID that prevented or prevents engagement. It, it certainly doesn't. Um, in terms of, of an answer to your question, we're still under pressure uh, resource-wise, uh, but this is something which ministers have indicated is important and is a priority to them. I can't give you a firm timescale for it at, at the moment, but you're right, we don't have an excuse or a reason to delay for much longer. And I think this is something that we need to get underway, uh, certainly within the next month or two, uh, and not much beyond that. Okay, thanks for that. And look, my final question then is about the McGee Medical School, because, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat from its NDNA commitment appears to have been treated like a hot potato of being moved between various departments and you know it was initially expected to be within health and then it's late to, it was taken into the executive office and, and now we're hearing that it's now moving from the executive office and going out to economy uh, and, and, and health and I mean we've seen um, the absolute need for us to have a skilled medical workforce, uh, you know, a health service that needs those personnel. You know, we understand the absolute need for a McGee Medical School because we're sending too many of our young people and professionals away to get trained, and then there's only a certain percentage that comes back again. So, you know, the capacity's there, the ability's there, the, the people are there. But can I ask why it moved from health to TEO? stayed a short period of time in TEO and then has gone back to health and, and economy again, just what that transit was for? Well, I think that move was more apparent than real, Chair. It was never really formally ours, but uh, TEO was doing just a bit of, a bit of coordination and facilitation work uh, around it in, in the early days. But your fundamental point, I think, is the important one. Uh, the medical school is needed and the executive has decided that it's going to happen, so it's going to happen. Uh, wearing one of my other hats, one of the things that we need to do as an NICS is become more adept at working across departmental boundaries and recognizing that we all work on behalf of the executive and we have a shared responsibility to deliver uh, the executive decisions and agreed priorities. Yeah. So this is one where the executive has decided that this is going to happen. So departmental boundary disputes between uh, civil servants uh, ought to be a moot point or, or irrelevant. It's incumbent on all of us now just to put shoulders to the wheel and get on with it. Uh, the good thing is that that is happening. Uh, as I say, it, it has been well advanced by colleagues in, in economy and health, uh, and they feel that they're on target for the first intake to be in September of this year. Okay, well, that, that's certainly welcome, and, and you know, it certainly landed in TEO long enough to be announced, which I suppose for some might be the priority. But, um, okay, I'm going to move now and ask uh, Doug, the Deputy Chair, to come in. Uh, thank you, um, Chair, and, and thank you, Chris, for, for your brief. Um, I'm going to put two questions into one to try and save a bit of, a bit of time, if I can, um, Chris, and it's for yourself. We talked about the ministerial um, codes, um, but following the Executive Committee Function Bill, the present ministerial code uh, is at odds with with that part that that new bill. Well, when are we likely to see uh, the ministerial code amendments or the new ministerial code being brought to the floor of the assembly for us to have a chat about it? Uh, and the second question, if I can, please, where are we standing in regards to the fiscal council? Um, and I know that could become a Department of Finance issue, but it's an issue which affects um, uh, the executive as per part two of the Northern Ireland Executive Formation Agreement. Um, thanks, Doug. Uh, if, I, if you won't, don't mind, I'll take those in, in reverse order. Uh, you, you've partially answered your own question. The Fiscal Council is indeed uh, a Department of Finance matter. Uh, I understand there, there is a proposal there uh, at a fairly advanced stage, but it hasn't yet come to the executive. 
again, that, that's just, a, a, I think, um, a consequence of the COVID pressures that uh, minister and officials are, are, are under there. Um, but it is recognised as a priority and the intention is to bring it to the executive uh, as soon as possible. It's something that the Secretary of State presses very hard and it has come up uh, a couple of times already uh, at, at the meetings of uh, the NDNA Joint Board. On the first question, I apologise. I don't know the answer to it. Uh, with your indulgence, I'll, I'll take that away and get an answer and come back to you today. Uh, that, that, that's, that's good enough, um, Chris. Uh, but I would say on this Fiscal Council, and I don't want to be hammering what the Secretary of State is hammering, but if we're talking about a Fiscal Council which was agreed in the Stormont House Agreement, a Fiscal Council that was agreed in the Fresh Start Agreement, a Fiscal Council that was agreed now in the NDNA um, uh, document, it, it, I, I just cannot see how uh, the executive um, uh, committee can just knock it off to to uh, Department of Finance to, to deal with this issue without holding them to account. Oh. So, uh, any comment on that, Chris? Are you happy enough to leave it? I, I absolutely recognise the point that uh, that Doug is making, and uh, more than happy to convey that back to DOF colleagues. Okay. Um, Emma Sheeran, oh, sorry, really, Doug, you shouldn't start by saying you're going to ask one question and then <laughs> go on ahead. No, I, I just said thank you, Chair. All oh, right. Okay, I thought you were you were looking back in again. Um, okay, then move to to Emma Sheeran. Okay, thank you very much uh, to both of you for, for the presentation this afternoon. Um, I don't want to duplicate or go over old ground, but I, I had been planning on asking uh, about Acne Gaelic as well. I know that, that last week we had presentations from the, the First Ministers, and that was one of the questions I'd asked. And given that the, the deadline that had sort of been set had obviously fallen away because of COVID, and I suppose... Following on from, from what you had said yourself, Chair, we are in an unprecedented year and um, I suppose there has to be cognizance of that. And, uh, you know, you couldn't in all reality expect that given the pandemic that we were in, that these things which which had been a priority were were going to be prioritised over, you know, responding to a, a health crisis. Um, but in saying that, we still have to recognise that a year has passed and these are, are big ticket items and we we'll want to see um, them progressed and, and we don't want to see sort of the the urgency completely removed from them. So uh, I, I thank you for, for your answer on that and, and note that. And I know I've been engaging with, with some of the groups around um, Acne Gaelic and it's, it's a present concern for them. Um, I had a, another question then, and I should declare an interest here because I'm the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on a Bill of Rights, um, just around the panel of experts. That was a, a TEO commitment um, and as part of NDNA, the, the committee set up on a Bill of Rights, and we have a consultation out at the minute. It's closing on the 29th of January, so anyone that hasn't already responded to it should do so. Um, but the, the, there was a panel of experts to be appointed for that with with five members and we've just seen a bit of a standstill on that now for, for several months. I just wondered if you had any update on that. Uh, Emma, if you don't mind, I'll take that. It is under consideration and uh, and hopefully um, a decision will, will be forthcoming in due course. Okay, are you happy enough, Emma, or would you have another question? Okay, no, no, that's that's a hundred percent. I suppose just that, and I mean, there were a list of strategies included in, in NDNA that had the the three month for sort of time frame deadline, um, and that's obviously passed. But I assume the answer on on all of them would be would be the same, and other things have taken priority. But no, appreciate that. Thank you. And and full marks for the the ability to get that unashamed advertising for that consultation in there, Emma. That's great. So well done for that. But uh, yeah, echo that. If there's a consultation from a uh, another committee, we'll certainly should encourage everybody to to take part in that. Um, I'm going to go to um, Trevor in the room, and then next to Martina. So um, Trevor. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Chris, for your presentation. Uh, it's just for clarification, the the, the change of name from Brexit subcommittee to executive committee considering EU exit matters. 
Uh, and I see that the terms of reference for the newly named committee have been placed in the Assembly Library. Is, is there any substantial difference between the activities proposed for the Brexit subcommittee and this, this new one? I mean, will, will the chairmanship be different? Will it, was the, was the old committee chaired by the first and deputy or the representatives? I don't think there's any any substantive change. I mean, to be candid, I think the, the, the change of title is, is perhaps the most uh, significant aspect of it. But I think it's just reflecting the, the, the passage of time that we're now actually beyond Brexit, uh, and indeed we're, we're beyond the, the, the transition period. And I think the feeling was that the title and perhaps some of the detail of the terms of reference just could be brushed up a wee bit to reflect where we are. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Okay, so then we'll pass over to Martina. If we get Martina up into the spotlight, then we'll go for questioning there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the, for the presentation. Can I ask in terms of any significant policy shift uh, within the new programme for government, you know, as we move closer to the post-COVID recovery phase, it's important that tackling poverty and social inequality and social inclusion becomes part of this outcomes development plan. So um, what I'm, I'm just trying to tease out more from yourself about the kind of policy shifts that will help uh, tackle regional inequalities, tackle commitments, uh, making sure the funding is allocated based on objective need, asking about an equality impact assessment. Um, is is that taking place in the in the program for government? And secondly, can I ask um, in relation to the new DNA? And I'm very conscious about all of the work that was done across the parties uh, to get the medical school, like you said, agreed and is happening, uh, Chris. And that's uh, and that is obviously something that we're very keen on in Derry, but. I think for the TEO, it's not just about the medical school and it's now moved back to its former location. And I have to say, I'm glad that the TEO uh, did that exercise and the, the Joint First Ministers were able to accelerate that work and take it forward. But in relation to uh, NDNA, the point about McGee is the commitment to the expansion of McGee. Like Derry has been waiting on university status since 1965. And NDNA uh, identified bringing forward proposals for the expansion of the student number to 10,000 as a key priority. So if you could give me a little bit more information on that. Thanks, Martina. Uh, uh, perhaps I could start off just with those first couple of points on McGee, and then I'll, I'll bring Jeffrey in, if I may, just around the, the, the equality impact assessment. Uh, in, in terms of, of policy changes, um, i make a general point first and, uh, and then a specific one. One of the general points uh, I think that we'll be trying to reflect when we move beyond and, and finalise the, the new outcomes framework and the overall PFG itself, one of the bits of feedback that we got uh, from engagement this time round and indeed last time round with stakeholders, and I think this came through during the talks process as well that, that led to NDNA, was that um, the outcomes are, are good and there's very, very strong and indeed solid support for the outcomes based approach. That people want to see something more than that as well. And if I could use a phrase that, that Alistair Hamilton used to use quite often when he was in, in, um, um, in West Northern Ireland, people need to see where the ropes touch the ground. So they need to see where uh, the, the delivery actually takes place that will lead to the outcomes. So we will have quite an emphasis in the programme for government on the key priorities and on, as you say, I think the range of strategies that need to be there to underpin and deliver uh, the, the PFG. So you've then got a sort of you know, pyramid or cascade. You've got the outcomes at the top and the PFG and the framework. You've got the key priorities that the executive will identify, and you've got the strategies uh, that, that will deliver those and make sure that the ropes touch the ground. Um, one of the most important of those, and certainly featured very prominently during the talks process, is an anti-poverty strategy. And I've no doubt that the, the Minister for Communities will see that as a, a core part uh, of uh, the, the delivery of, of NDNA uh, and the PFG. Just on, on McGee, uh, you're absolutely right. There are two um, actions in NDNA, not just one. Uh, the first is uh, the medical school, and that is, as I've described, I think well on course for uh, re recruitment this year. 
uh, the, the larger overall expansion um, not so far on. Uh, and my understanding is that that's not yet uh, at, at, well, sorry, it's at business case stage, but there hasn't been a business case, a detailed business case submitted to the Department for the Economy yet. That one is very clearly in, in uh, economy space. Uh, the medical school uh, clearly uh, cross-cutting because it involves DOH uh, with their policy input there. The more general expansion of McGee is more straightforward in the sense that it's Department for Economy Territory uh, because they lead on um, higher education. But as I say, the um, response or the update from, from colleagues there is that that action is not as well advanced and there's a bit more work to be done by the university itself in terms of bringing forward uh, the, the, the business case. Happy to come back on that, but I'm, I'm conscious you also asked about the quality impact assessment. And if I could ask Je Jeffrey just to describe the approach that we're taking to that. Sorry, um, Chair. Yeah. Chair, just before Jeffrey comes in, just before you leave that point, Chris, just so I'm clear uh, and people in Derry are clear, because then we know who to lobby and how, how best to try and take this forward. So the business case for the expansion of McGee, what you're telling me is that it's still with the University of Ulster and that hasn't been submitted to the Department of Economy yet. That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Chair, I'll just come in now and, and, and just to add to what, what Chris has already said there on the anti-poverty strategy and the importance of the supporting strategies. You'll see at the front of the consultation document that that pyramid structure that Chris has described is actually uh, put very much up front, that the PFG would be supported by a number of strategies, including the very important anti-poverty strategy. And it also emphasizes the importance of um, the outcomes building and working towards an inclusive society where people of all ages and backgrounds are respected and cared for, and that the outcomes that are contained in the program are, are to be applied to everyone and that no one is excluded from those. So in support of that, um, we have done an equality impact assessment. So the, the framework's already been subject to an EQIA screening process. And we've done an EQIA, which will, which will work, uh, which will go out in parallel with the consultation. So on Monday, when we launch the consultation, um, you will see on the website and where that launch is taking place, there is also an EQF through the EQIA document as well. And that will be consulted on in parallel with the, the, uh, with the consultation then. Chair, if I might just add a, a little bit more to, to that uh, related to it. Um, one of the things that we'll be seeking to do in, in the programme for government this time round is to, to change its nature a bit and, and make it much more accessible. So we, we see it much less as a, you know, a, a paper document and much more as a living document. So it'll exist mainly uh, on, on the web. That means that we can update it um, regularly as it, as it goes through. It's not fixed. Uh, for five years or, or for, for all of the mandate. Uh, we can adjust it and, and change it as the executive sees fit going forward. And along with that, that in itself has to be a, an engaged and engaging process and one that has the assessment of quality impact at the center of it. So we'll be trying to make the, the data much more accessible uh, to people as well. And, and the data will be analyzed by Section 75 category. So as the program for government moves through its lifespan, uh, citizens and interested stakeholders will be able to see evidence of the outcomes of the delivery uh, in relation to Section 75 uh, groups and we'll be able to feed that back to us and we'll do our own analysis on it of course as well and that will allow us to adjust and change the PFT as we go along in response to that. Mm -hmm. And just to add to that again, Chris, the actions within the programme themselves and any new policies as they're brought in would individually be subject to EQIA in the normal way as well. Um, Ch Chair, my, just my concern, and uh, sometimes these EQIAs, we get too much screening out. Um, and I'm, I'm happy listening to what Jeffrey and Chris has said there because it would appear to me there's something maybe perhaps different happening this time around with this program for government because um, whatever about the rubber hitting the road and the delivery, and that's crucially important, but we need to make sure that we're making a difference to people's lives. So that data that you're talking about, Chris, sometimes it become uh, people can say we can have all this data, but it's how you measure it to demonstrate that we are making a difference. And I think we have all the information, but we seem to be doing the same thing over and over again. They have the same outcome because we're not changing the policies that we're bringing forth. is not actually changing the outcomes. And I'm hoping 
that that's what this program for government is driving forward because I was a little bit concerned, Jeffrey, when you said it, it might have been just my misunderstanding that the outcomes apply you know, equally to everyone. Well, of course you can't if you're talking about an anti-poverty strategy, regional inequalities and targeting those most in need. Um, so I, I'm hoping, Chair, as, as this goes forward, um, that we get more of an understanding of the work and the implications and the actions that's going to be taken on the EQIA. And that's something that I uh, would recommend, Chair, that we would just keep more of an eye on and, and get a readout as that's happening. And Chris and Jeffrey, I would be quite keen to hear more and be more involved and informed about all of that. Sure, happy to do that. And there's, there's a, I think, a, a couple of reassurances that can offer there on, on one challenge for us. The reassurance is, firstly, it's, it's not screened out, it's screened in, uh, most definitely. And as Jeffrey said, it's not actually even a single EQIA where we say, right, that's that done. Uh, we, we've done the analysis on the programme for government. We'll do another one in, in a few years' time. It's actually ongoing. So if you like, it's continuous, a quality impact assessment in this. And in all the other dimensions of, of the delivery as well, the challenge for us, uh, I think, then, um, for all departments and certainly all officials, one of the things that we're not very good at, um, this is not unique to us, we're quite good at coming up for ideas for, for new policies. The opinions vary on how good we are at actually delivering them. But I think most people would agree one thing we're actually very bad at is stopping things where, where the evidence shows that, that they don't actually work. So we, we need to use this, this data and we need to use the engagement to identify the policy interventions that aren't working, that aren't effective and, and efficient, and stop doing those and, and redirect the resources into the things that we know do work. And again, that needs to be an outward facing project. It's not something that we should do in a darkened room. So it's very important that, uh, you know, the phrase that I use, and, and it risks being a wee bit trite, but the democratization of the data, I think, and this is very important, it needs to be an outward facing process. Mm -hmm. okay. And the live, the live website or the live web based program that, that we're developing, that will allow for the publication of all of that data uh, and all of the information. So that'll be there for everyone to, uh, to see. It'll be updated on, a, on an almost daily basis as, as new data comes online and as new uh, statistics get published and so on. And there'll be um, the EQI information there to, to, to view in relation to that. And the, the narrative around what's happening in relation to that, are things getting better, are they getting worse, are they flatlining, and why, are they, well, why is it the way it is? So that will all be out there. It'll be for people to see and for people to challenge us on that. It's one of the advantages of the, of, of the web-based pro, uh, pro approach. Okay. That's thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you for all of that. And I would just ask you, Chair, just to keep account of what I said about the EQIA because the democratization of the data, they pick up Chris's phrase. I like that phrase because I think that's is going to show us as a committee that the policies that are taken forward are making a difference to people's lives or not, as the case may be. And therefore, we need to stop doing a policy, implementing a policy that isn't making a button of difference to people. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And, and maybe the um, suggestion of the, the briefing on the programme for government and, and the consultation element of it, that might be something that we could really unpack at that stage and make sure that that's included as a, as our views on that. So thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask next for Pat to come into the spotlight. Pat is the final member that has indicated that they wish to speak. So uh, I'll bring Pat in to ask his questions unless during his contribution, any other member indicates that they want to speak. Okay, Pat. Thanks, Chair. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, on the out outcomes-based approach in the original programme for government, there were 14 outcomes. That has now been reduced to nine. So could you give the rationale for that, Chris? And secondly, uh, just given the cross-cutting nature of most of these outcomes, uh, how are we going to get the departments to work together? Thanks. My goodness, that second one's a difficult question. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, on the first, uh, I'll invite Jeffrey to come in behind me as well because he knows more of the detail of this the, the, than I do. But largely driven by, by feedback uh, from departments and from ex external stakeholders, not so much in terms of people thinking that, that things were no longer important or were now important that hadn't been thought important before, but more about clarity, I think, and, and the ease of, of understanding. I don't think genuinely, I think we can say that we haven't 
dropped or deprioritized anything that was, was formerly thought to be very, very, very important. It's just we think we've got a, a more coherent way of, of presenting it now. Uh, Jeffrey will say a little bit more about that. Your second question, I think, remains a very, very significant challenge for us because one of the things that, that we constantly emphasize is that for, for the program for government to have maximum effectiveness, it needs to be one leg on a three-legged stool. So you need a multi-year program for government, a multi-year budget, uh, and a legislative program uh, to, to deliver it. Um, we'll have a multi-year program for government. Um, we'll have a, a multi-year legislative program, or at least through to the end of the mandate. What we don't have yet is a, a multi-year budget, and that's very, very difficult. And this year's budget is, is particularly challenging. Even if we did have a multi-year budget, we don't have budgeting by outcomes, we have budgeting by departments. So th there's a real challenge for permanent secretaries as, as, as accounting officers, and, and Mark as well, mm -hmm. who's our accounting officer, who's required to spend the budget under the control and direction of, of, of the minister in relation to the department's statutory functions and, and activities. But what we really need to secure some of the outcomes is to create the incentives for accounting officers and ministers to spend money across departmental boundaries. So lots of good examples that we heard uh, you know, during the engagement. For example, many of the people who turn up in, in custody suites at, at PSNI stations have mental health issues. So the stationing of, of community mental health nurses in custody suites can divert a lot of those people away from the justice system when what they really need is, is, is health care. That only works when we create the incentive for colleagues in the Department of Health to spend some of their hard-pressed budget uh, in the justice field. Likewise, Substance Abuse Court, uh, I think, has been extremely effective at diverting people uh, with substance abuse needs or needs arising from that, again, out of the judicial system and into the health system where, where, where they get the help they need. But that requires getting the Department of Justice to spend its scarce resources on improving a health outcome. And at the moment, I think many accounting officers would argue that the incentives aren't right on that, uh, and we need to change them, and we actually need to make it easier for people to spend their money across departmental boundaries. And I can't claim that we've got an answer to that today. I think that's something where there's certainly further progress to be made. We probably look a bit enviously at our colleagues in Scotland who, I think, find that easier, but that's because they don't have departmental boundaries. There's just a single Scottish government. Uh, and, and the, the boundaries are much, much easier for them to overcome. I think for obvious reasons, we'll not be in that position uh, uh, here, but we do need to find a way to make those barriers less of an impediment to the sort of cross-departmental working that you're rightly pointing to. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that uh, question and answer there at the end. Uh, uh, Chris, there's a very thought-provoking as to finding ways to encourage that cross-departmental uh, uh, working and you know, it may involve something akin to having a, a central budget to which uh, is left separate from everything else to which you know joint ministers can come together with initiatives and apply because ministers like money uh, so if the, the only way they can get it is by coming together with another minister to deliver a project um, it, it could really bear some some useful um, fruit through that but look we have no further um, uh, members indicating that they wish to ask a question so um, I'm not so sure, Chris, I see speakers, uh, keyboard, and you've got a microphone on your headset, so I don't know if you're going to sing us out at the end of this uh, presentation or whether we'll just maybe we'll move on. But thank you very much for your, your presentation today, and we'll see you maybe in a few weeks for the oral briefing on the uh, Programme for Government consultation. Thank you, Chair. Because you. you've been so fair and generous to me today, I shall not sing. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, um, we'll just let people exit from there and then we can uh, move on. Uh, members, is there anything that any actions were down to just sort of the members on the screen? So if you want to raise that electronic hand or your own hand, I should be able to see you at this stage if anybody wants to add anything as an action from that. Okay. Okay, then we'll move on then to item seven, which is the uh, forward work program. Uh, it's at page three to five of the meeting pack, page 36 of the table pack. Um, 
just to let members know that the oral briefing on the Internal Market Act, which was scheduled for today, was withdrawn due to the changes to the bill prior to being passed at Westminster and because the Department for the Economy is taking the lead on the matter. Um, it would be apparently unusual for two committees to be interrogating the same issue from the same officials. Um, so it's maybe just given that there has been a bit of movement. I know that we would have been requesting that briefing back maybe in November time when, when times were different, but the outcome of it has moved into more of an economic issue and Department for Economy. So would members be happy for that to, to continue to be the case? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, at page 36 of the table pack is uh, an invitation from the uh, Senate Special Select Committee on the Withdrawal from the UK from the European Union. Um, what we basically have done is they had asked for us to meet with them, but we think that there are some changes that they are undergoing which may see their sittings on a Friday rather than a Wednesday. Um, the confirmation at this stage isn't 100% for that. It's expected in the next few days. So I'm going to suggest that we leave that as a standing, as it is, as an invite. But if it does move to a Friday, maybe we could look at a smaller delegation from the committee uh, that it might suit uh, maybe to meet with them on a Friday afternoon at some stage. So can we leave that one just pending and we'll come back to members and confirm on that? Yes. Okay. Uh, are members content to note the rest of the forward work plan? Yes. Okay. And then item eight, in terms of correspondence, there are seven items of correspondence in the meeting pack and two in the tabled pack. Quite a number of them are, involve correspondence between Michael Gove MP and various committees, which are there for members to note. But is there any item of correspondence that anybody would like to raise? Okay. Okay, and then just that under any other business then, uh, there was an announcement by the Finance Minister of the Draft Budget 2020-2021. Uh, are members content that the committee writes to the department to ask what the implications of the draft budget are on the department? I think there was a, a substantial uplift in the budget for the department, and I think we've all a fair idea of what that will be about, but I think it's just maybe incumbent upon us in our scrutiny role just to get, seek clarification on that. So members happy enough if we just write and ask for a written briefing in the first instance on on the, the budget from the department, and then if anything comes from that, we can get an oral briefing. Yes. Okay, that seems to be grand. Uh, any other member with any other business? Um, okay, I think we're all okay. I'm just noting now, Martina, your blue hand is up there, but it may be that it's not down from the last time, but I think that's you're, you're okay for the moment, yeah. Okay. No okay. Thank you. Okay, members. In that case, then that is uh, the meeting concluded. Um, the date time uh, for the next meeting is this day next week at two o'clock. And just to remind members, and it wasn't here at the start that we're going to go for a fully virtual meeting next week. So. Um, if I could ask for members' indulgence at that stage, there may be a few teething problems with the technology, but hopefully Trevor will not ask for any more uh, closed sessions and we'll be okay. And we'll, be, we'll be fine, but I'm sure we will be okay, but we'll see how we get on with that next week. So, members, thank you very much indeed, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.